Buildings are responsible for 42% of global annual CO2 emissions. Think about that. It's enormous. A lot of what we talk about in terms of looking at transportation, industry, is the single largest area that is affecting global warming. 17% of that uh, is the uh, cement, the iron, the aluminum, and the steel, the products we put in the building, but 27% of that is the operations of the building, how the buildings work, their function each day. And that's having a big impact on the world. Well, what's happening? We're out of balance. The relationship, our relationship with nature is out of balance. We need to start rethinking what that relationship is. We need to think about a balanced relationship where we give back as much to nature as we take away. Because right now, we're really out of balance. What are the effects of this, and what are we seeing? I don't have to call out to many of you, we're seeing tremendous extreme weather, floods, droughts, and areas that we weren't used to seeing them in the past, energy and water scarcity, something that we see in Ecuador today with the rolling blackouts, something we thought 20 years ago we wouldn't ever see again. There's environmental pollution. That photograph in the top is a, live, is a photograph from New York City, and that's exactly what it looked like one day when we had tremendous air pollution in the city for the day. You couldn't go outside. There's pollution in the, um, the rivers and streets. When I take a trip down a river in Guayaquil, it's tremendous to see the garbage that's uh, collected on the side of the, uh, side of the shores, and I see the plastic that's going to be there for the life of my daughter and possibly into uh, the next generation. So as designers, how do we think about this, and how do we prepare for it, and how do we talk to our clients about uh, the future? So what you're looking at right here is something we use in our office, uh, climate software, and this is looking at the city of Guayaquil. So this is specifically at the city of Guayaquil. And uh, it's the weather from last year. And uh, I'm 56 years old. My daughter's 28. So I'll try to use that as a context of looking towards the future. Uh, on the chart, you can see this. It's 80% comfort, 80% in the comfort zone. What's the comfort zone? We, complete, we look at the comfort zone as 48 degrees Fahrenheit to 79 degrees Fahrenheit, or 9 degrees Celsius to 26 degrees Celsius. Uh, really, that's a comfort level that you can exist where your buildings don't have to do that much work for you. So Guayaquil, as of right now, is a fairly comfortable city to live in. And you can see, though, on the bottom, that's all the stressed area, the heated areas. And it's still pretty hot uh, in Guayaquil. But this is what it is today. Let's roll, the, let's roll uh, this forward 27 years. 27 years in 2050, what is the climate of Guayaquil going to be like? Based on the predictions we have now, based on where we're going, based on what we're putting into the atmosphere in terms of carbon, we're looking that uh, the comfort zone, the zone that will be comfortable to live in, will be 33%. So the environment is, com is changing a great deal. That means that the, the, uh, the heat stress zone is up to 50%. Up to more than 50% of the time, we need our buildings and our environments to keep us safe because we are outside of that zone that we're able to work within. The average temperature is anticipated to be about 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius. That's tremendous. And you can see all that red area uh, where even in the middle of the night, it'll be too hot to exist comfortably in the city of Guayaquil. Let's jump the clock ahead again to 57 years, 2080, Guayaquil, Ecuador. When you're looking at, uh, this is a time uh, my daughter will be 50 in her 50s, or sorry, my daughter will be in her 80s at that point. Apologize to her. My grandchildren will be in their 50s. No pressure to my daughter who's getting married uh, next month. Uh, it's <laughs> Just put it out there. Uh, but the city of Guayaquil is only going to be 20% in the comfort zone. It's completely flipped from what it is right now. Now we only think about 20% of the time when we have to really be careful about the built environment to protect us. Now, only 20% of the time the, built, the, the environment of Guayaquil will be comfortable. The average temperature is going to be 85 degrees or 29 degrees Celsius. That's, depending on who you are, it feels almost unlivable in that city. So what can we do to begin to turn the ship and not uh, face some of these dire, dire um, uh, consequences? So in the world of uh, architecture and construction, we really think about things as uh, climate mitigation, climate, uh, climate adaptation, and resiliency. And I think it's important to talk about all these words because we should all understand what they are. So climate mitigation is quite simple. Think of it like a bunch of dominoes, and you put your hand in the middle of it, and you stopped it from happening. So what can we do today 
to stop this from happening? How can we hold the risk back? Well, if we're, build, if we're using hydrocarbons in our building, we know that's adding carbon to the atmosphere, we stop using them, or we begin to eliminate using them. So that's climate mitigation. In the middle there, there's climate adaptation. We think of that really like a chameleon. When a chameleon goes into the forest and he has green, uh, green leaves around him, he turns green, so he blends in. When he goes to an environment where it's yellow, he's going to turn yellow. So it's adapting to whatever that environment's going to be. In the case of climate and architecture, that would be if we know there's floods coming in, well, maybe we can build a wall to keep us safe so that when that flood comes in, we're safe. But really, we like to think about the next step, resiliency. And what is resiliency? Oftentimes, it's, re it's confused a little bit with uh, adaptation, but it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than this. And I'm going to bring up a, a reference of Wayne Gretzky. I appreciate that I'm in the middle of a country that plays soccer, but Wayne Gretzky is a, uh, is a great, and, uh, great um, hockey player. And he used to have this statement where he said, you skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. And that's how we think about resiliency. It's where it's going to be in the future, and let's solve that problem now. So rather than just keep getting after the problem as it's occurring, let's think about where it's going to be in 27 years, where it's going to be in 50 years. Put that in our mind and begin to work in a more holistic way, something that's more system-wide. And that's what's going to help uh, bring us into a safe area. Now, in our firm, we always talk about good design is sustainable design. There, it's a not, a, not a separate activity. We can't think about a good design unless it is a sustainable design. And it's a responsibility of engin every engineer, every architect, and every uh, person involved in the industry to work on sustainable designs. It's a problem. When we're working on sustainable designs, we put them into three separate buckets, each of them having different emphasis, each of them having different areas to be concerned with. There's first the public sector. We have to think about cities and communities and um, things on a large public le level. There's the development community, there's developers and real estate um, um, are the products that we live in, then there's homeowners and, uh, and business owners. Each of these have different, uh, different drivers and different things for us to be concerned about. In the public sector, we have to be careful about not making our plans too ambitious. We have to make our plans uh, reasonable in terms of things that we can get solved within that environment. It takes a lot of actors, a lot of people working together to get a cohesive, uh, to key, cohesive uh, guidelines. We should be setting guidelines on a city and national level for the public sector. From the development community, we have to be very careful about where we're getting our information from. There's a lot of voices out there. We recommend that you go to uh, third-party verification, uh, begins with third-party verification, uh, third-party groups that, um, that uh, like lead and passive house that can tell us we're doing the right thing. At this moment, you can Google anything, and you can find out any answer you want to find out, but make sure that when you're investigating things, you're looking at unbiased evidence data that uh, is coming from groups that aren't beholden to special interest groups. As we're making this shift, there's a lot of special interest groups that are really interested in us casting doubt and keeping with the system that we have. And that's one of the real challenges from the development community. And for homeowners, it's not too different. There's a lot of, of so-called certifications and, and low carbon this and that, and we really should be looking to uh, some very uh, some some third-party verification systems systems that we know uh, uh, are, are real and work from a homeowner or a business owner You should be thinking about reducing your water use reducing your electrical use Recycling more and we're not talking using less to make your life less comfortable There's a lot as we've heard from some of the other present presenters today. There's a lot that we waste so we're saying, let's not waste as much. Let's be a little bit more careful about how we use it, and it can have a substantial effect on the built environment. We're putting this into practice today in Ecuador in, uh, in our office um, for Perkins Eastman. So we're very, very proud that just recently we were awarded a uh, LEED Gold uh, certificate for an office interior. Uh, this building, we know, because it's a, uh, been independently verified to use 30% less water, 17% uh, less energy, 80% access to natural light. We have five air changes per hour in the, in the room, makes a very healthy environment. 40% less uh, waste going to uh, landfills. And we have a lot of things that are very, very simple. We have exterior shades on the building. 
Guayaquil has a lot of sun. If you put the shade on the outside of the building instead of the inside of the building, you, you cut down the heat so it does, you don't have to have as much air conditioning. Because of the modeling tools we have, we, can, uh, we, can, we are able to measure that, and in Guayaquil, we're saving $3,600 a year on, on electricity alone. We chose LEED because it, uh, out of all of the different systems, and there's many third-party systems out there, it was the most comprehensive for us. It, it, it uh, checked, covered the most bases, and it allowed very good third-party verification. It was very helpful for us. What's interesting about this system is you're seeing it pop up in many places. Here's an example of a building from a Group uh, Obram. They're architects here in Quito. I don't know them. I've never met them. But I know that the building they have uses 45% uh, less water, 22% less energy, 21% uh, re recycled materials in the building. And it recently received a LEED Platinum, which is phenomenal. What's great about this is that we live oftentimes in a world that is zero-sum. When you win, I lose. It's not like that here. It's reversed. Their winning is our winning. Their winning is, is my winning. And we need to think about that when we're looking at uh, sustainable design. What's really kind of fascinating is, let's look at all of South America in terms of what's happening very quietly. In Ecuador, there are 46 lead accredited buildings. That's 46 buildings that have independently been, been verified to use less energy, to recycle more. Throughout South America, you're seeing there's six in Bolivia, 14 in Paraguay, 351 in Argentina, 494 uh, in, uh, in Chile, Chile, and 1,586 in Brazil. This is extraordinary. This is amazing and happening in all these independent places at once. So this makes us think, well, maybe we're onto something. Perhaps there's something more that we can do. Maybe we've stumbled upon something here in Ecuador and here in South America that is bigger than even just sustainability. With 3,292 buildings independently verified, we begin to wonder, can we, begin, can we start going after some of the other challenges we're facing? And what are those other challenges that we're facing in, uh, in this part of the world? And here I bring you back to one of the first few years I spent in South America, and I, I witnessed and later went to visit. There was a 7.7, a horrible 7.7 .7 earthquake in El Salvador in 2001. Roughly 3,000 people died. And the deaths were attributed to the fact that the buildings weren't safe enough. They weren't built to a resistance level that could protect them for such an earthquake. And you look around, we're dealing with a lot of problems beyond the sustainability in construction. And a lot of people might say, hey, listen, with the problems of earthquakes, flooding, fire, sustainability is just another one of those problems that we've got. But in, uh, in 2001, we did something. A bunch of us got together, and I was responsible for writing an article, and we petitioned some members of U.S. Congress to write a bill that was eventually signed into law called the Cost Act in 2001. It was made to train building code, uh, train people in Ecuador and El Salvador on, uh, you, on proper building codes. It was a 2001 uh, um, IBC was one of the things we were looking at. So it's been 23 years. What's been the impact? Very little. Sadly, very little. We still don't have the same level of, of um, codes and standards in, in Ecuador and for much of South America to keep our buildings safe. So herein comes the spark of an idea. If 3,200 buildings in South America can be independently verified to utilize a higher standard of design that we know can incorporate better technology, why don't we take the groups that are in this corner the lead, the edge, the passive house, and have them speak to the groups in that corner that are the CCs, the ASTMs, the ULs, the NFPA, these groups that really propagate worldwide some of these wonderful standards, and maybe begin to learn from what we're doing on a sustainability level and transfer it to other areas of, uh, of construction and architecture that can help everybody in general. And let's let them help us. So here's a photograph of my daughter 
when I was 28 years old on a beach uh, in, uh, in Ecuador, actually it's in Olón, uh, where she's going to be getting married soon. Uh, and, um, you know, I, this kind of excites me because I think we're at the precipice of something really wonderful here. In terms of sustainability, we have a chance to take a real crack at the problems that are facing South America. And it's happening organically throughout all of South America. We also have a chance to, if we open up the door, to go after some more problems that have been plaguing us for 23 years that we haven't been able to really take a good crack at. So what's my message here? My message is for architects and engineers in Ecuador and South America, get certified. Get your LEED certification, get your Passive House certification, get your ED certification, become educated in these methods. Join this really great revolution that has been started. For institutions like ICC and NFPA, talk to USGBC. Talk to other organizations that are really rolling out something incredibly practical here. And let's learn together. Our children are going to judge us on what we're doing today and what we're leaving them and what our footprint is. Let's make it a great footprint. Thank you.